USDA logo, United States Department of Agriculture. I would now like to introduce Paul Wester, the director of the National Agricultural Library. Thank you, Wendy. Hello, and welcome to our National Agricultural Library webinar event, What Does the Future what does the future hold for corn and maize? I'm glad that you could all join us today. Before we proceed any further, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement developed by one of our collaborators and partners, the University of Maryland, and adopted by us here at NAL, as our institutions are situated on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people. Every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to migrate from their homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than could be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. At the USDA's National Agricultural Library, we believe it is important to create dialogue to honor those that have been historically and systemically disenfranchised. So we acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were among the first in the Western Hemisphere. We are on the indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respects to Piscataway elders and ancestors. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. Again, hello, and welcome to our webinar entitled, What Does the Future Hold for Corn and Maize? I'm Paul Wester, and I'm the director here at the National Agricultural Library in Beltsville, Maryland. We are a part of the USDA's Agricultural Research Service in the Research, Education, and Economics Mission Area. The functions of the National Agricultural Library, or NAL as we sometimes call it, were established in 1862 with the creation of the USDA. Today, NAL is one of five national libraries in the United States and holds one of the most extensive food and agriculture collections and related science material collections in the world. Serving USDA scientists and administrators, researchers and the public, the National Agricultural Library facilitates the creation of agricultural knowledge um, through the acquisition, curation, and dissemination of agricultural information. Today's event is the third and last webinar in our three-part series entitled Maize, Corn, It's Science, Culture, and Cuisine. Through this series, we've explored maize and corn as a global food staple and its role in food, culture, and society. With our speakers, we've tied the issues We've tied the issues related to corn and maize to the USDA strategic priority areas of environmental sustainability, social justice, and nutrition security. During today's event, we will learn about the influence of corn and maize on public health and society. When U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack returned to the department in 2001, he made clear that advancing racial justice, equity, and opportunity in food and agriculture are top USDA priorities. The National Agricultural Library has embraced these priorities and in many different ways, including through programs like the one we're having today. Today, we are fortunate to hear from two speakers um, who will discuss the long history of governmental disregard for indigenous and black knowledge in food and agricultural expertise and their connection to the land. Our speakers will discuss land and food sovereignty, describe collaborative ways to eliminate food and health disparities, and outline how the systemic racism built into our agricultural systems, built into our nation's agricultural systems, um, impacts us all. Each will also elevate how historically excluded and otherwise marginalized communities lean into difficulties to build deep resilience, create opportunities, and thrive. I look forward to the information and knowledge and the historical and intergenerational wisdom that they will share with us today. So, on to our speakers. First, we will hear from Denisa Livingston, a community health advocate 
at Diné Community Advocacy Alliance. Ms. Livingston is a food justice organizer who advocates for tribal communities by focusing on public health, native food ways, and promoting better health through indigenous foods. Our second speaker is Dr. Psyche Williams Forson. Dr. Williams Forson is a professor and the department head or department chair of the American Studies Program at the University of Maryland College Park. Her research is focused on the ways in which Black people engage their material worlds, especially with food and food cultures. Some of her recent projects focus on food shaming and race in America. And I am personally awaiting delivery of Dr. William Forson's latest scholarly work, Eating While Black, Food Shaming and Race in America, published just this month by the University of North Carolina Press. Following the speaker presentations and time permitting today, we will have about um, five minutes or so for questions and answers. You can enter questions into the chat at any time. They will be compiled during the presentations and I will moderate um, the offering of the questions um, at the end of the presentations. We now uh, begin our presentations. I would like to welcome our first speaker, Denisa Livingston, Community Health Advocate at Diné Community Advocacy Alliance. Please take it away, Ms. Livingston. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Denisa Livingston, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, I am um, here on the Navajo Nation, the, the New Mexico side. I'm going to introduce myself in my language. Um, just introduce myself. I'm from the Red House People Clan. I'm really um, excited to be here. Thank you for um, the invitation. I've been a part of the consultation of the three webinars, and hopefully you have all enjoyed um, the two previous webinars. And today, I just I'm going to take a moment to just share with you some slides information. I know we don't have uh, much time, but it is a time that you know we're very thankful for. Um, I also just like to recognize the homelands that I'm on. Um, to honor the relatives and the youth and the elders, both the past and the present, who have stewarded this this land of Turtle Island, and also um, the generations moving forward, we also um, recognize them. Um, like I said, I'm in the Four Corners area in Dinetra, um, which is the homelands of my Dinet people. Neighboring tribes here are the Hopi, um, the the Ute Mountain Ute, Southern Ute, Hickory Apache Nation, um, and as well as the Zuni Pueblo. And so, I just recognize uh, my relatives. Relatives. And then also, I just like to recognize today is um, the International Indigenous Peoples Day. And so some of you probably have joined us on our Twitter chat this morning, um, recognizing the importance of the roles of Indigenous women and youth, um, and as well as addressing um, climate resilience and climate change, and as well as um, recognizing the need to support Indigenous languages. Um, there are some four 476 million indigenous people worldwide, and we represent over 5,000 distinct cultures. Um, and we steward about 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity on 25% of the planet's surface. So it's a really important day. Um, I hope you know those of you that are on social media will be able to engage in some of the dialogue, but also the activities and, and especially this webinar that we are holding today. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, um, as I move forward in my slides, um, this is um, one of the youth um, had created this health rug. And so I hope you are influenced by all of the different beautiful pictures and as well as the art um, as we are more on Zoom um, and in these uh, global platforms that we're able to share this type of um, healing artwork. Um, I'm an organizer for the Diné Community Advocacy Alliance. And we really stand on our goal of what is written here in Diné. Um, and if you want to repeat after me and, and say, let's live a long life, um, this is how we say it in Diné in one of the dialects. Um, 
And just as it is difficult to say, it's just as difficult to implement. Um, and so as we move forward um, in our work, and some of you may be familiar with some of the things that we have done from the local level to the international level, um, we really pay focus on the integration of community engagement and community empowerment um, and focus on sharing our story as it is really important that us as indigenous people are presenting our ways of life our our ways of doing and our ways of being and that we are the narrators of what we are presenting and so we always ask the question what is our story what is your story as you get to know yourself no matter if you're non-native or if you're native um, it's really important that we're able to um, see the way forward together in 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 providing um, opportunities, providing um, indigenous peoples um, ways of supporting their voices and their stories. And so, um, here's our story as um, as I'm here to share. Um, and I'm, if you can see in in the video here, um, here's a recent um, um, harvest of our white corn. Um, our Diné white corn just from last week. And so as we're here talking about corn and maize and maize, um, you know, we don't use those words. We use the Diné word, nada. And so this is something that is very precious to us. It's our way of life. It's very holy. Um, and it sets really the framework of how do we do our work. And I grew up dry farming with my grandma in my family, um, my grandma Jessie, who is um, over 90 years old now, um, who has showed us really the resilience and empowerment of growing our own food. And so um, here's a picture of some of the corn um, from the pandemic um, that my parents and our family has been able to produce. Um, it's such a beautiful um, representation of what community is and what community work is and what it represents. And so the words um, that we have um, for our corn, there are many um, different interpretations and many different um, um, ways to describe our corn in the way that um, it is made, the way that we uh, produce it, but also the way that we eat it. So one of the ways um, with our blue corn, um, blue mush, some of you um, may may be aware of that, um, and that is called Todd Nail. And then um, we also have our steamed dried corn, um, which is very popular, um, Nashdiji, and then also the corn pollen, which is Tedidine. So there are different terminologies. Those are just a few examples of our relationship with the corn, but also um, our story. Um, it's you know found in our songs, it's found uh, in prayers and ceremony, um, but also in our creation stories as we think about um, um, the precious life of the corn and what and what it has also brought us to be able to enrich our lives. And so our work um, with the Net Community Advocacy Alliance and many partners, many of you have been a partner of our work, is really focused on community advocacy and mobilization and seeing you know, the equity and inclusion and justice work that is really important when we talk about this here, the, um, what's seen in the picture, a J Bidzid, which means strong heart or heart strong. And our youth created this um, image here. And as we think about the role of food in our work, we think about the healing aspects and the healing frameworks. It's really important as we look at these different references here on how do we incorporate that, especially now with climate, um, um, change in looking at um, the prayers and looking at the prophecies and looking at how do we apply um, spirituality um, in the work that we're doing because many of what is passed on through generations is through prayer, is through um, spiritual um, actions and activities. And so we need to really be mindful as we move forward because some of those are very sacred and the space that we create, you know, really needs to be a brave space, really needs to be um, a space where um, everyone can be included included and everyone is respected. So some of the work um, regarding our food system work and protecting indigenous life ways and food ways have really been through policy and legislative efforts on the Navajo Nation. So for the past decade, we have been working towards how do we help community members to be 
um, at the critical points at the table to be able to um, author pieces of legislation, to be a part of including indigenous languages in our, in our food ways, but also in the policy work. And what is really important is, you know, most of our people um, are not giving these opportunities um, when it comes to um, government work, when it comes to advocacy. And so what we had to do is really um, bring out um, the emphasis to um, call on our Diné fundamental laws to be able to see that our people uh, have the opportunity, that they have the right to be able to access these ways to make change, to create positive change. And so that has really been an important aspect of our work because we do stand on, um, on leading our youth to be leaders without titles. And also um, many of our people may not have a formal education. And, and so as we look at their lives um, as lived experiences, um, also as expertise that they're able to be um, at the table with us and with everyone, especially our elected leaders. And so through our work, we have um, um, worked with several elected leaders that have championed the work forward um, and as well as maintain um, the ability to be able to see how important it is to address our food systems, to address um, our food ways and our life ways, especially through the pandemic and what has happened and what um, continues to occur in indigenous communities. And so this is just the background of um, two of the sister laws that we have passed, um, the tax-free healthy food law, and as well as the Healthy Dinner Nation Act of 2014. Um, this is really important as we think about um, emphasizing not only Diné foods, but indigenous foods, and as well as addressing the contamination of our food waste um, through unhealthy food. And this is a word that also we did not have in our language. Um, in Diné, we did not have the words because it never existed. And so we had to consult with our community members and the words that um, were identified is Ion Bajol, Ion meaning food, and Bajol meaning the scraps, the crap, the prison food, the unhealthy food, um, the food that contaminates our bodies, the food that doesn't belong in our bodies. And so thinking also about the indigenous languages and, and how we approach this is really important. And so um, as of 2020, we've raised over $9 million, funded over a thousand community wellness projects across the Navajo Nation um, to, to identify um, the needs needs and um, the critical um, projects that um, that need to be made and available to our people through funding um, that can come, you know, from the people themselves. And so, you know, addressing um, the physical and social environment is really important, you know, as we think about the grief and the pain, the nutritional trauma in our communities. And so as we, you know, plant more of our gardens, plant more farmings, and even planting um, in, in pots or even in containers, because we know that many people may not have the health capacity to be able to steward some of these activities. We really emphasize, you know, what can you do? What are you capable of doing? And so it's important that we recognize, you know, even from, you know, the small level all the way to, you know, what, what people are able to do with their families and with their communities is very important. And so the money of the tax is used um, in, in really in several ways of how the community members are able to identify um, whether that they need, you know, improvements in, you know, it, in water projects or farming projects, gardening projects, um, exercise equipment, um, recycling initiatives, um, intergenerational um, classes, cooking classes, um, food preservation classes, um, all these different types of examples of what the communities are able to do. And so this has been our background of our work. And through the pandemic, we were able to renew the act as it had a sunset clause of 2020. And so um, we went through the whole legislative process through the pandemic um, to be able to renew this act because it is still the only um, um, act of its kind in the whole nation. And it's led by our indigenous people. It's led by us um, as the Navajo Nation um, is able to um, make this a reality, but also know that taxation is a part of our culture um, as our ancestors and our elders had told us, you know, they had to tax themselves to be able to survive in different types of taxation, whether it's 
you know, having one child, you know, whether, you know, it's, you know, um, refraining from different foods, refraining from different harmful practices, there are different ways. And so this has really been an important concept, um, but also a reality for us as we move through the pandemic, um, addressing our needs. And so even the word um, for COVID-19, dikos natsaiki, nas eitsata, that is the way that we reference um, COVID-19. And we think about UNESCO's decade now from 2022 to 2032 about the indigenous languages and the importance of supporting that. It's really important that we think about the impacts it has, especially with um, the solutions and challenges and opportunities regarding all of the global challenges that we see now. So as we think about indigenous public health and thinking about creating partnerships to be able to do that, looking outside um, our communities, but also protecting the communities in a way that we are moving, you know, at the speed of trust. We are moving um, at the speed um, of the communities and in, in, in what their conversations look like, what their concerns look like, and what their challenges look like. So, you know, edifying these strategies, you know, to be able to empower ourselves, to be able to tell our stories, to be able to indigenize frameworks and indigenize our food ways and life ways is really important. And so this is just one example. Here's my cousin, um, Josh, who is waiting um, for a kidney transplant. And we, we see the reality of when the masks were coming to our communities that it was not you know, a perfect fit for our faces. So we had to create our own mask. We had to be able to establish a method, a process. And early on, we bought sewing machines. But this is just an example of how Indigenous people need to be at the table, how we need to be on the platforms to be able to consult, to be in dialogue, to be able to um, to be in conversation about these critical issues, but also knowing that we're the ones who hold the solutions and strategies um, that is much needed now, but also going forward, how do we incorporate incorporate that, um, you know, we, we cannot have people speaking on our behalf, we have to be at the table from the youth um, to the elders. And so as we think about also um, creating our own PSAs, um, creating our own change, um, being a part of that change, what does that look like? How are we able to do that? How are we um, able to facilitate that? And so it's really important um, as we think about the ways going forward. Um, and this is a picture here. And like I mentioned uh, earlier, our steamed dried corn, um, the strategic capital of the world. This is um, right down the road for me at Chiprock, New Mexico. Um, this is a mural, you know, that we drive by and hold very dearly to, you know, the realities of what does um, native futures look like, especially healthy native futures as we collaborate um, intertribally and work, you know, towards um, the health and well-being of our people and, and across Indian country um, during the pandemic, what we were able to do was facilitate um, the need to support seed sovereignty, to be able to hold these seeds, to be able to know that we need to save our own seeds. And this brings um, the attention about um, the Native Seeds Protection Act um, that needs some more support and that needs to be supported going forward to be able to protect our seeds. And in this, um, with the corn, um, white corn, blue corn, um, yellow corn, red corn, um, even uh, types of um, native um, popcorn, um, these types of different corn has have we have been trading with other tribes and also um, distributing these seeds across our communities um, throughout the whole pandemic. And some of our partners are the Traditional Native American Farmers Association and as well as the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, and so some of the work that we're doing is also helping our communities to save their own seeds, to be able to utilize this in a method, you know, that they have seeds for the future that we're looking towards, you know, how do we have more seed banks? Um, as we see one at Tezuke Pueblo, um, we can see these seed banks um, now being created by indigenous communities. And we're also in support of um, gifting those seeds um, that are from many aspects of um, our local farms, but also indigenous farms across the country to be able to hold these seeds in a safe manner. And so as we think about the inclusion of indigenous practices and traditions, all of these things here is critical because it is medicine. It is our way forward. It is 
it holds solutions, especially uh, me growing up dry farming, you know, and, and grandma, you know, really not speaking about the resiliency of it, but speaking about how we're being able to incorporate this into our diet and how do we facilitate that process. But now we're talking about resiliency. We're talking about adaptability, um, these types of terminology that we use in our language when we're talking about food systems. But grandma never really used those words because that's the way of doing and being. And so now for us, us, you know, we have to be able to facilitate those types of discussions because that's where we are in trying to learn and relearn, relearn, reprogram, and also ask, you know, what are we planting? What are um, we putting on our palate? How are we reprogramming our palate and our tongues to be able to facilitate our own healthy foods in our diets? And so um, as we think about, you know, the future, we think about the youth. They're very critical in the work that we're doing and to be able to incorporate some of the things that we're doing, whether it's through Zumba, whether it's, you know, talking, you know, um, with them at the tribal council chamber, um, whether it's, you know, taste education, um, whatever it is, we're doing all of these different critical um, creative um, things. Um, before the pandemic, we are, you know, meeting more in person, but of course this has been, you know, less facilitation in person, but we look forward, you know, as we go through some of the different um, activities together online that we're still learning. I think during this time of the pandemic, Indigenous communities, Indigenous organizers have really um, um, came, you know, in, into more um, activity, and that has been a really beautiful thing to be able to engage on this level, um, and as well as connecting um, with the youth in different manners. Um, last month, we were at the University of Arkansas um, to be able to facil facilitate a collective um, healing experience with the youth, um, identifying indigenous foods, you know, what does, you know, does, what does it look like? What does it taste like? How do we cook it? Um, how do we process it? And so we were able to um, um, create this um, engagement with the youth to be able to um, facilitate their own banquets um, for the leadership summit. And so it's a really interesting um, time, you know, as we think also about the lack of access um, that our people have. Um, we emphasize indigenous foods, but many times our people do not still have access to it. Um, and so also, you know, um, the cost of indigenous foods is also increasing. And so what we've also been recognizing you know, are some of those foods that are keeping our communities um, whole, that are keeping our communities in resilience um, to be able to stay in their foods that, you know, what do they have in their kitchens? What are they able to make from what they have in their kitchens to emphasize, you know, maybe we have to do something to incorporate some indigenous foods and then some of what they have in their cabinets to be able to survive, to be able to thrive, but also to be able to work in, in small ways to support um, their lifestyle, but also knowing that we have to transition towards a healthier lifestyle and, and to know that we have to reclaim our palate um, for indigenous foods. And so as we think about the international work um, that is important, I was in um, Polinsa, Italy last month at the University of Gastronomic Sciences. Um, it is the birthplace of slow food. I just served um, five years as a slow food international indigenous counselor of the global north. And so we will be electing a new council next month. Um, this is our international convening um, that will happen September 22nd to the 26th um, in Torino, outside of Torino, excuse me, um, Italy. And so as we met for the Congress, these are some of the motions that were passed um, last month. And some of them, you know, are very critical as we're thinking about these um, global climate problems and issues as we think about how do we steward the way forward? How do we have an opening to greater public consciousness of sovereignty of native sovereignty and cultural rights and honoring um, the truth of narratives and as well as lived experiences, but also recognizing the realities um, and the grief and the pain that has come from nutritional trauma, the lack of access to healthy food, the lack of access to heirloom foods and also the protection of heirloom foods. And so, if you're interested, um, you can just um, ask Grandma Google. Um, she's very helpful to be able to um, help us to learn about these different things that are helping um, that are happening on the international level. Um, just Google this information, um, and as well as um, looking and reading um, at these different motions to be able to facilitate your knowledge 
but also the way forward. And if you're interested in attending um, the event, um, all the information is online as well. Or you, if, if you're here in Turtle Island, you can connect with Slow Food USA um, as well as we will be taking a delegation next month. Um, and as we think about the work um, in Indigenous Terra Madre Network of Slow Food International, um, this is something that we have been critically involved in and we'll hold um, some panel discussions, some activities, some demonstrations um, involving the youth, involving chefs, involving advocates, growers, farmers um, next month um, at the Terra Madre event. Um, but also moving forward, we've had um, these different um, events and engagements and activities um, um, at the international level. Um, and so, you know, it is really important as we connect and also um, know that there's so much more work to be done to be able to facilitate the change that we have. And so a part of the work um, internationally is, is what we're focusing on in our communities is the is reclaiming our taste buds and also changing the way that we're eating and changing the way that we see food. And so um, during the pandemic, we did not uh, meet you know, physically for our group and for our organization and, and with many partners. And what we did um, with our advocates for one year is to provide at least three items, maybe items you know, that are healthier, a tool that they could use um, in the kitchen, um, and as well as something that maybe they wouldn't ordinarily buy um, out of their own pocket. So we provided three items and the advocates um, cook these items or pro you know, process it or even you know, um, made a recipe, um, created a dish um, and shared it with the family. And so this was really important in understanding you know, what types of foods are available but also knowing that we need to have these types of engagements um, with our communities and set that example. And so um, some of the other foods, you know, that we were incorporating in these um, food kits, you know, were our traditional indigenous foods. And so um, one of our partners from Ramona Farms in Arizona um, provided some of these um, um, beans and as well as um, grains that we're able to share with our community members. And we had friends um, and partners to be able to gift these foods to us. And so we um, transferred that to the community members to be able to um, taste these foods that they ordinarily would not find here or um, they would not buy, or even if they did not know about these foods. So it's really important as we think about programming our tongue, not just only for taste education, but also for liberation, that this journey has to be liberating. Um, I know, you know, it's policy is not in everyone's interest, but, you know, it's really important as we think about creative ways about how do we, you know, um, continue to support the Healthy the Nation Act? How do we support food policies? Um, and how do we support food laws that are important, you know, for our communities? Um, and so, as we think about also the creativity of what the community members hold um, and how they're able to engage with the foods, how they're able to um, think about the way food is processed, thinking about the way food is cooked, and also eating together as a family and in, in harvesting together, planting together, growing together, um, not only physically, but also mentally, um, psychologically, and spiritually, all of these different um, aspects of growth. You know, what does that look like? Because we know that food is healing. Um, that is in Dine, um, healthful food is life. Um, and so as we think about um, how we use our languages in this aspect, like I mentioned at the beginning of um, this webinar, he said, let's live a long life. And that's our goal and focus on how do we move you know, towards the future and how do we hold this capacity to be able to facil facilitate change and look at mental health as well um, when it relates to food and some of the mental um, health work that we've been able to do with the advocates is buying those sewing machines as they, you know, were, were at home in isolation, that they were not able to go anywhere as we had the lockdowns, as the Navajo Nation was one of the epicenters early on. Um, we really had to identify how do we, you know, work with our, our community members, you know, that uh, where we're not able to see each other, right? And so they started to make aprons, they started to make pot holders, these little things that may not matter, mattered the most. And so we are still 
continuing our efforts to be able to help also the youth learn how to sew, learn how you know to do these different um, types of crafts, um, but also to be creative in their artwork and their jewelry um, and all these native crafts that we see. And so um, take a moment if you want to go to our website to be able to see you know what's what we have on there. Um, as they get down to um, the last few slides here, um, we had um, early on for about a decade, um, we had a, a challenge um, that we would do in person, but also um, promote that the tribe um, and, and as well as anyone who wanted to you know, partake of our challenges, um, we had a cut the crap challenge. So CRAP, Carbonated Refined Artificial Processed Foods for 10 days, not eating these foods. Um, and so we, we're doing that you know, almost on a yearly basis, just raising awareness, get people's you know, um, input and their pictures and activities. And so this year, what we wanted to do for our 10th anniversary is take that to another level. We wanted to do a let's eat in, let's eat indigenous 10 day challenge. And so um, I'm wearing the t-shirt today. Uh, it's a really beautiful design um, by our dear Josh um, who has designed this, but it's really important as we think about cooking together, eating together at home, eating more local foods. If you don't have access to indigenous foods, who are your local farmers? Who are your local growers? You know, getting to know them, making those connections, partnerships and relationships, because as we move forward and look at the critical work that's being done at the White House, the White House initiatives um, with our sister, um, Deb Holland, and as well as, you know, the initiatives of the um, integration of um, traditional ecological knowledge into policies that is coming up and, and also that needs to be supported and as well as the conference on nutrition and also hunger. Um, you know, the, the government has not had a conference like this for over 50 years. It's really important as we think about, you know, some of the activities and dialogues that will happen, the presentations that need to happen. And so it, this is not something that we see on a local level. We see this on an international level. Um, we see this, you know, with the youth, with elders, with people really thinking and being mindful about what we're putting in our bodies, what we're growing in our fields to, to be able to know, you know, that the corn that we're growing, you know, and to be able to facilitate, you know, how precious, you know, the corn um, nada is, but also, you know, how do we facilitate with that? You know, this with the youth, you know, we ask our youth to plant these, to be the ones because um, we believe, you know, the youth um, hold um, the preciousness to be able to facilitate the growth of the corn. Um, and so this year we had the youth plants and then also the first harvest we gave back to the youth. And I know a couple of years ago, some of our um, indigenous relatives in Alaska and the Arctic Circle, they passed the law where now that the youth eat first. So any of the feasts that they have, any of the festivals that they have, it's not the elders that are eating first, it's the youth that is eating first. And so um, before we would allow the elders to, um, to eat before, but we're also trying to practice, you know, because we know that the youth too are, um, live in a generation and also a culture of unhealthy food, right? The crap, the carbonate refined artificial processed food. How do we help them to have access to the healthy food, to the indigenous foods? And so this is really important as we see the work, you know, on that level of not only facilitating our own change, but also having those partnerships um, with one another to be able to taste these foods together. And so part of our challenge that we had is our advocates um, created uh, some of the signage. You can see them on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, and thinking about what does it mean to let's eat in? What does it mean to let's eat indigenous? Um, grandmother's food is medicine. Um, this is from one of our elders, um, Mr. Leroy Sosi and his wife, um, you know, eating well is prayer. And so as we think about also the facilitation of helping these elders um, to be able to create something like this is important because this is something that will last a long time. It will last, you know, for generations about their interpretation and what their vision is and stewarding, stewarding that in a in a way forward that is healing and also hopeful for everyone. And so as we think about our work and also the collective power that we hold, the collective
collective action that is happening, um, but also the priorities that need to be addressed from the local level to the international level. Um, we think about the widening disparities and inequities, but also the increasing vulnerabilities that our communities hold and continue to go through through the pandemic. Um, we think about you know, the creative um, and collective strategies and solutions to be able to help our people to facilitate these in their food ways and life ways. And so as we think about our corn, um, this is a picture from our fields um, here. It's really important that, you know, we get our hands dirty, you know, go in your garden, go, you know, you know, like my mother, she loves to eat dirt. Um, and so that is also facilitation of like, you know, what, what are we able and willing, you know, to do to be able to think about, you know, the wholesome, healthy food that, you know, that our soil, uh, our healthy soils are growing, but also knowing the process and facilitation to be able to help community, community members to understand, you know, what it takes to grow corn, what it takes to grow our own produce, the beans, the squash, the sunflowers, all of the sisters to be able to facilitate that um, in our in our spaces, in our balconies, in our gardens, um, um, in your office. You know, you see all these plants here at my home. You know, how do we have that relationship with our non-human relatives? Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, everyone, for your attention and what I've been able to provide. <laughs> I know our people say, you, you speak so fast. And I always say, I'm sorry, but the Navajo Nation Council gives me five minutes, but it's really one minute to present. So if I spoke too fast. I apologize about that to my people. I need to present slower. I know that, but we need more time um, to be able to facilitate that. So everyone, Ahiha, will take um, some questions after um, Dr. William Forsythe presents. So thank you, everyone. Ahiha. Thank you so much, Ms. Livingston. That was an outstanding presentation. And as you um, suggested, I'm going to transition over to um, Dr. Uh, Williams Forson, the professor and chair of the Department of American Studies at the University of Maryland in College Park. So take it away, Dr. Williams Forson. Greetings, greetings. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Denise, I appreciate it, um, those remarks. So in, in, in the short time that I have, what I, I think I'm gonna do is just talk just a bit um, about uh, African-American uh, foodways in America, um, to coincide with much of what uh, Denisia said, our cultures are similar in the sense that, um, as, as you all obviously, I would hope at this point know, uh, most uh, Africans in America uh, were here, came here uh, by way of kidnapping, uh, violence, and brutality from the continent of, of Africa, specifically from the West African region. Um, a couple of things I just want to say very quickly is that it's important for us to remember that enslavement was both um, a process uh, built on race, as well as a process that was built very much on economics, um, and that African people were brought to this country specifically um, because they were considered less than human and because of the wealth of agricultural knowledges that they had prior to coming, um, uh, not only to the Americas, but also to the Caribbean. Um, and so the West Africans who did survive the Middle Passage uh, to North America were very diverse in their language, their communities, um, and their lives. And then they found themselves here in this new terrain where they were um, introduced to new foods, but also uh, some of those foods that had been brought over on slave ships, um, such as peas and uh, plantain um, and other foods that they had already been introduced to uh, in their home countries were, were deliberately brought here in the hulls of the ships um, both as food for the voyage, but also to be planted um, in the Americas, right? And so many of the uh, enslaved who arrived much later came with that knowledge. Let's also be clear about um, Africans having been in this country as early as the 1500s, when uh, many of them were not enslaved, and so they were entrepreneurs and so forth, some of them, um, but then much later, as the formal slave trade took hold, you know, this was a process by which these foods were brought um, into this country. You know, one of the things I want to say early on is that there was a, a relationship 
between indigenous people in this country and Africans, um, as well as uh, settlers, uh, European settlers. In fact, it was uh, mostly indigenous people, native people um, were the reason that uh, settlers were able to survive, right? At the same time, it was settlers who introduced smallpox and other kinds of what is considered bio warfare, um, killing out a host of, of, of native peoples. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to mention is that initially there was some intermarriage between uh, Africans and native people. And uh, in one of the earlier research um, for my first book, Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, Black Women, Food and Power, um, I found that there were some deliberate laws passed to keep that intermarriage from happening, right? Because with that um, intermingling, there, there was a power source there. Um, and so part of what Europeans did was divide and conquer, right? Um, as one article, which I'm actually going to um, drop in the chat because I think it's a, a very good um, piece that you might want to go back and take a look at. It's an article by, um, uh, let's see here, Lindsay Lundford, Melvin Arthur, and Christine Porter, and it's titled African and Native American Foodways and Resilience from 1619 to COVID-19. And it's a very, very good article and I'll drop it here in the chat. But one of the things that they say, um, which I think is very interesting and useful for us to, to know, um, they say African and Native Americans, I'm quoting here, had much in common in their food ways, including one pot stews and using fermentation for food preservation. Native Americans adopted black eyed peas to such an extent that some mistakenly thought they had originated in North America. Corn became a staple among enslaved people and in West Africa as well. Intermarriage and native sheltering people who escaped slavery was very common. For example, one of the direct relationships Native and African Americans had in this period was via enslaved people in the southernmost colony, colonies and states escaping to Spanish colonized Florida. Some worked for their comparative freedom by fighting the British and Native Americans on the side of the Spaniards, and some escaped and formed Black Seminole communities near and occasionally with indigenous Seminoles. Early contacts also occurred across the Americas because European explorers who often preceded invasion usually brought enslaved servants and most usually of African origin. So the point simply there is to suggest that there was this uh, formal intermingling, um, not just of cultures, but of life ways and of bodies to create um, African, Afro, Indigenous communities. We know that there's a huge history of um, some tension there and that's an entirely different conversation for another day. But the U.S. economy was built then on this, uh, on, on the, uh, the labor of those who were enslaved, the lives of the enslaved uh, Blacks and those whites who were well off uh, to have um, slaves were deeply intertwined as well. So the history of Black people in this country um, is, as we know, fraught with discussions of labor, of land, of uh, brutality, and ingenuity. And so one of the things that I often try to share with people, um, because we are fond of saying Black people's food ways consisted of scraps. In my new book, which um, was mentioned earlier by, by Paul, um, which is titled Eating While Black, uh, Food Shaming and Race in America, which is due to be released, I think, this week, next week, um, you know, I try to dispel this myth. Yes, those foods were absolutely scraps, offal, um, a peck of meal. Many um, um, slave narratives talk about uh, these foods uh, being given to them. But I want us to think about Africans and the African-American people as resilient, as the article says, right? As resilient and creative, right? And so if you then have been brought to a place and you are surrounded by the amount of forestry that was here, 
uh, during that time and and the amount of of um, of animals that surrounded you. Um, and and we know from the records that there was plenty. Um, African Americans didn't just uh, eat what was given to them, but they were creative in the ways in which they were acquiring foods. Uh, one quote from uh, my colleague Fred Opie in his work on African American uh, food cultures, he says by the 19th century, and that's the other thing we have to remember, enslavement was over three centuries. By the 19th century, African American foodways displayed corn, rice, greens, pork, pork seasoned foods, and fried foods. Over time, the planter class took great delight in the dishes of those whom they enslaved, such as chitlins, turnip greens, collards, and kale simmered with pork parts, roasted yam, gumbo, hoppin' john, cornbread, crackling bread, cobblers, and various preparations of wild game and fish. So my point simply is that there has over time been this evolution, right, in that Africans and then African-Americans made use of the land in order to augment what was given to them, right? Um, those who were allowed, depending upon the type of plantation that they were living on, some did have um, gardens, some did engage in entrepreneurial ventures such as uh, vending different types of foods, eggs, selling chickens, selling other kinds of foodstuffs, right? And so people were resilient, right? We were not acted upon. We were resilient in the ways in which we tried to make lives for ourselves and also for those um, in our families. Again, according to plantation records and narratives of previously enslaved people, um, yes, these rations were very um, meager. But again, I just want to emphasize that a lot of uh, enslaved people's homes and cabins um, on plantations, based on the archaeological evidence, there are uh, remnants of pig, cattle, horse, sheep, goat, deer, possum, rat, rabbit, squirrel, raccoon, you name it. And then, of course, if you were close to waterways, you had access to shellfish and oysters and freshwater mussels and uh, other kinds of marine clams and other kinds of food. So we have to be careful about simply assigning scraps to Black people's food waste. And what I argue in my new book, Eating While Black, is part of that narrative is very deliberate. It's a very deliberate way of assuming that Black people are always ever presently victims, right? So we have to be careful with how we talk about the scraps that Black people ate. That was part of our diet, but it wasn't the whole because to assume that we only had scraps assumes that we weren't smart enough to use the environment um, around us. Um, like those uh, Native people who encountered a number of push-pull factors that pushed them to the reservation, pulled them to reservations, such as the Indian Removal Act of 1830, the Long Walk of 1864, the Buffalo Massacre. You know, African Americans also um, encountered various push-pull uh, um, factors post-enslavement, right? Um, the bull weevil, which affected the cotton crop, the Ku Klux Klan that doled out violence. Um, and then, of course, the pull of the industrial era, which brought us into not just the North, right? We didn't just migrate to the North. We migrated further South. We migrated to the West. We migrated lots of different places. And it's important also to know about migratory strands because we, you know, we have these narratives that we uh, we share every year during Black History Month or now during Juneteenth that make Black people appear to be very one dimensional, when in reality we are as diverse as the number of cultures from which we hail, right? Um, still, and so as we move into thinking about where we are today, um, you know, part of what I do in my new work is take on this notion um, of gardening. I want to be very clear here to say I absolutely am an advocate of eating fresh food and of eating um, whole food and of gardening, if that's your desire. Um, 
I, for many years, have tried to garden. It didn't work for me. And and uh, I, I'm now, I do plants, and, and which is another, uh, but may, which may or may not be edible. But one of the things that I found in my research um, is that when we think in terms of Black people, we have to remember that we're also talking about um, folks who have migrated to this country voluntarily. So either from the Caribbean, um, from Haiti, from uh, a number of other parts of the African continent. Um, and so it's it's not always possible to grow the foods that sustain one's cultural life ways um, in America, on American soil, right? Um, I had a, a young man come up to me at one point after giving yeah, a talk. Yeah. And, um, oh, and he shared that um, he had tried for uh, for a long period of time to grow his own food, some of the foods that were familiar to him in Trinidad and Tobago. He said, but by the time I got the soil to how I needed it to be, the temperature and the climate had changed. And so the moment had passed, right? And so it's important to realize, I think, that um, because in the last several years, one of the things that we seem to have done, and one of the reasons I wrote um, Eating While Black, is because we seem to have gone in this direction where we only, and this is in no pushback on anyone, but I want to explain, we seem to only focus on growing our own food. And I hear a lot from people that that's the best thing on earth for some people, for some people. And I say that very specifically, because we can easily move into this space of shaming people who choose not to grow their own food. Um, I had this experience during the talk I gave out in California where a young woman said, how do we get people to stop eating at McDonald's? When we think about the complexities of our lives and how we move about our lives on a daily basis, um, it may not be possible for us to get people to stop eating fast food. Um, because some people, it's all they can do simply to have a place to sleep, whether it's a car under a bridge, um, whether they're moving their child from one part of, of the DMV, uh, the district, uh, the, the DC, Maryland, Virginia area to another part of the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, and oh, we have to stop by Chick-fil-A. And so my politics is coming into play here because I don't really want to go to Chick-fil-A, but I got to be able to get these nuggets because my child has to eat. And we're in between, you know, this place and that place. And oh my God, but am I a bad mom if I stop here? We put so much pressure on people on a regular basis around food. I I'm saying all this to say, I absolutely think we need to eat wholesome and healthily. And I think these things need to be available to us, but we know all too often that many uh, black and brown people uh, live in areas, regardless of your means, where you have to travel quite a distance to have access to even foods that look appealing to you. Uh, I, I, I talk about this in, in Eating While Black. I talk about farmers markets are not a panacea. Grocery stores are not a panacea. What we need to have access to our variety of options. I teach in a, a film in my uh, in my food trauma sustainability course that I teach here at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, on um, uh, it's called Good Meat, and it's a story of a man named Bo Lebo, uh, who is Oglawa Oglala uh, Lakota. Um, and in this film, he's on the Pine Ridge Reservation. He talked about being over 300 pounds, his mother having died of diabetes, and he wanted to claim an indigenous diet for himself. Um, and he tried. And um, one of the things he wanted to eat was bison. Well, of course, the Department of Interior owns, you know, the land on which the bison are. And so by he said by the time he got the bison, had to pay for it and then had to get someone to dress it and then cut it um, and so forth. It was so expensive. Right. That should not be. We know that that should not be the case. I'm happy to say that in a recent article in Civil Eats on the Pine Ridge Reservation, that more folks have found ways to grow their food because at that time, 
Mr. LeBeau said he was unable to grow his food because the uh, soil that was uh, surrounding their home was mostly made of clay. So, but new programs and so forth um, have enabled more people to grow their own food. And that's important because for them, they would have to drive 80 miles to the closest grocery store, which was Walmart. And he argued that, you know, his sisters primarily would buy sugary foods, sweet foods and so forth to appease their children um, because we know our children are, are a major influence in that way. Now, why do I bring that up? Because I talk about the challenges of trying to eat, if you will, healthy. We find this today uh, in, in Black communities as well. We do have um, our own heirloom seed projects going on. We are growing gardens. And many of us are eating at corner stores and local markets and so forth and so on. And, and my, my uh, closing comment to you would be that we need to encourage people to eat in multiple uh, different ways. Because I tell you this as I close out, um, because I know our time uh, is waning, um, that I can eat the most perfect diet. And being Black in America, I can also wake up tomorrow and be shot in my home or going up the elevator in my apartment, right? So I wanna take that pressure off of people. We do need to be healthy and we need to be mindful of the policies, social and cultural uh, and political that keep us ensnared in situations that could cause us to have a heart attack no matter how well we eat, right? So we need to be doing both and not either or, right? But we also want to not give food this wrap so that it takes on this heavy, heavy weight and that people become bad people if they don't eat a particular way. Um, I, I need for us to be very clear about that because even as we are advocating for people to eat healthy, we need to also be living healthy for our mental health, our physical health, our cultural and social health. I need to be free to run down the street and not have to worry about the possibility of being called the N-word, which could affect my psyche and does affect my psyche as much as eating good food does, right? So I, I, wanna, I wanna say that because I think sometimes we try to do this either or thing. You know, you would live longer if you only ate like this. I would also live longer if I didn't live in a racist country that just still sees me as less than. And we need to be very clear about that. So even in our struggles, as we acknowledge that we are moving forward, I want us to never forget the past. Remember that people are designed, uh, do desi uh, have these conversations that seem to always put African American people in this box where we are not progressive, we're not moving forward. Absolutely we are. And we want to be able to live in liberty, with liberty and justice for all, just like everybody else in this country. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that presentation uh, this afternoon, Dr. Williams Force. And every time you are with us, I learn something new. And um I just wanted to say thank you and give you a moment to appreciate some of the commentary that's in the chat. And um, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege and let us go on maybe a minute or two longer than um, we otherwise would. And I just have uh, one opening question for, for both of you to answer. Um, and that is, um, how can non-BIPOC uh, individuals support collective healing and be good allies in these processes that um, each of you talked about today? And so I'd uh, like to turn it over to you, Denisa, to kind of take a first crack at that question. Yeah, I think there are several ways um, that we can do that, that folks can be involved, um, is really going local, you know, um, finding out, you know, who those growers are, those friends are, those acquaintances um, that you can create, you know, some relationships, some friendships with and um, start locally you know, get outside your community or in your community, in your local, you know, community in your state um, to be able to navigate, you know, what that looks like. Um, and when you do start that relationship, relationship, um, you also start to learn of the challenges that they face. You start to learn of the realities, just like our sister, you know, explained. You start to learn, you know, what needs to be changed, you know, what ought to change. And that hopefully leads, you know, to some advocacy, to some conversations, some hard dialogues, um, some exchanges, um, but also maybe some healing aspects of sharing a meal, of, you know, gifting, you know, um, one another some knowledge or some food or, you know, something that, you know, to be able to support one another. Um, and even a prayer, you know, we don't know, you know, in, in many aspects of, you know, what is to come and thinking about the social, um, 
um, impacts of, you know, how do we hold relationships and how do we do that through food is really important. And so I think, you know, as we um, engage in that level, um, you know, that will lead to, you know, more greater um, associations, but also participations, you know, whether with, with our organization, whether, you know, with international organizations, but really getting to know where you are, who's there, who's involved, and what is happening um, on the ground there. It's, it's, it's a starting step. Thank you. Um, we have a hard stop with our interpreters at 2.05, so I'm going to give them a minute and a half to Psyche to comment on that question. Right. I just would say absolutely. Um, again, what um, <clears throat> our sister Denise has said, and people ask, talk to people, as she said, right? We all have complex lives. We all just trying to make it through this, this world um, as gently as we can, being as gentle on the earth and as gentle with one another as we can. The more you find out about people, the more you find out that some of the things you think they should be doing, they're just not capable of doing, or they're moving through that space and maybe coming back. But appreciating people's differences, appreciating who we are as individuals, as collectives, as part of communities, as part of communities with histories. I say absolutely, talking to people, uh, don't assume that you know what's best for other folks, right? Don't assume that they want a community garden. Don't assume that they want to do this, that, and the other, but rather ask them, what can we do? How can we be in solidarity with you? Because sometimes what is easiest for you may not be what they need to have done. Thank you again for those words. Um USDA is an equal opportunity provider, employer, and lender.